let's look at atonement here for, for this evening. Um, if we say that word, atonement, how would you define it? Someone were to ask you, what's the atonement all about? What would you say? Making something right. Making, okay, making something right. <laughs> I heard something, I didn't hear where it came from. Making something right, that's good. Anybody else want to venture a, a definition? Tough crowd tonight, Jess. They are. They do not want to participate. They do not. We can so. start calling on people. <laughs> Matt, how would you, what would you say about atonement? In place of. Okay, in place of. To pay for, to replace. Okay. So to pay for, replace. These are all good. Making amends for a wrongdoing. Making amends for a wrongdoing, for sin. Okay. Good. Excellent. Okay. Well, tonight we are going to really spend our time looking at the Old Testament and how the Old Testament helps to frame this idea for us of atonement. And then next week, we are going to make the move to see how it is just, uh, how it just takes center stage in the New Testament and the work of Jesus. But to really help us uh, get there, I think seeing it, how it's grounded in, in imagery and in ceremony and in sacrifices in the Old Testament is gonna be really helpful for us to really just dive into the riches of, of this word. So that's going to kind of be our plan. I want to start tonight with, even before we get to looking at, at the law and the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, even before we get there, Genesis chapter 22 in verse 7. I've heard theologians say this uh, could be called the theme verse of the Old Testament that this is, this is one of those major movements through the Old Testament where Abraham is taking his son, his Isaac, the promised son, that was the son of, of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, that through your descendants, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And then God told him to take that son that he had waited a hundred years to, to have. He says, take him up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. To me, And so the picture in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham, heartbroken, is headed up Mount Moriah with Isaac. They've got the wood for the sacrifice. Is it caught in my beard? All right. He's got the wood for the sacrifice. He's got the knife. Uh, he's got the fire for the burnt offering. And Isaac's a pretty sharp young man. And he sees all of these things, but he notices something's missing. And in Genesis 22, 7, he says, Father, here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? All through the Old Testament, that is really the question. That is, that is the look like, where is the lamb? Where is the sacrifice that is going to satisfy and make it possible for man to be right with God? So this, this, this sets up for us where we're going to go. And so in the Old Testament, this is the picture. And we even see it here at the very beginning of the Old Testament. But there's a couple of Hebrew words that we need to look at uh, that are going to come up as we, as we go through this tonight. The first one, the word for atonement in the Old Testament is the word kippur. Where have you heard that word before? Yom Kippur. What is that? It's the Day of Atonement, right? It's the most holy day of the Jewish calendar. Uh, it's the most holy day of their year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, and it means, uh, we talk about this, to pay a debt. It means to purify. There's another word that's going to be important for us to understand, and it's this word, cabaret, and it means an atonement cover or mercy seat. Where have you heard mercy seat before? What in the tabernacle? In the tabernacle? What is the mercy seat? The sacrifice. 
The Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, this this top that sits on the Ark, right? That these two cherubim are, are facing one another. Um, they are on the mercy seat. This is the mercy seat on top of the Ark. Where was the Ark? Where did it Where did it reside? It's in the Holy of Holies. Um, and so that word, cabaret, is talking about this mercy seat. We're going to see this as we go through tonight. But, but this word, these two words are really important. They're going to come into play tonight. We're going to see them again next week. But yes, this, this Ark of the Covenant that the mercy seat uh, is the top of here, it would, it would rest in, in these places. Uh, as the children of Israel are in the wilderness, they get instructions to build the tabernacle, this portable dwelling place for God. This is where they would offer sacrifices. This is where the presence of God dwelt with his people until the temple is built by Solomon in Jerusalem. So you see in the picture there to your left, where the Ark of the Covenant is. You see that there in the Holy of Holies? In the temple, where would it have been in that structure? Yeah, all the way in the back, in the, in the tall, in the largest part. That The Holy of Holies would have been inside there. At the back of that uh, is where the Ark of the Covenant was, and on top of the Ark rest sat the mercy seat. And this is significant uh, when we think about atonement, as we're going to see here in just a little bit. It's an important word that is used. Uh, over a hundred times the word kippur is used in the Old Testament, primarily in the, the books of the law. Genesis through Deuteronomy is where this word is used. Um, it has a lot to do with what we talked about, sacrifice, payment for sin, uh, to make something that is unclean, clean. I don't know what to do with it. There we go. And it takes something that is unholy. This word atonement, right? Take something that is unholy and makes it holy before the Lord. Um, so you see places here where we're going to see places where it's used. But I think to set up where we're going tonight, we're going to spend a lot of our time in the book of Leviticus. And I know that just sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> anybody read through, anybody read through the Bible before in a year? Yeah. yeah. Where do you get stuck? <laughs> Leviticus and Numbers, right? It's like, oh, if I can get through there, it might be smooth sailing, uh, at least for a while. Um, and so, but Leviticus is important for us to understand in the Old Testament, this idea of atonement uh, that the Hebrew people, God's chosen people, uh, his covenant people would have understood. And I want you to get a picture of what's going on here. So there's a video I want you to watch, and I think it'll help generate some good good discussion and for, for us tonight. So without further ado, let's get started with this tonight, okay? The book of Leviticus, we know you've been avoiding it because it's weird. So let's fix that. Now remember, the story of the Bible began with humans in God's presence, but they were banished because of their rebellion. However, God wants to be in relationship with us, so he chooses one family that he will use to restore the world back into his presence. And so God's presence comes to dwell in a tent right in the middle of Israel. And that's great. But it creates a problem because it's so intense that Moses can't go in and other priests who enter inappropriately, they die. Well, wait, if God's presence is good, how is it all of a sudden dangerous for people? So think of it this way. God's presence is like the sun. It's pure power and goodness. And when something mortal and corruptible gets close to such pure power, it's destroyed. And so the word holiness is used in Leviticus to describe God's pure and powerful presence, which, like the sun, is both good and dangerous. So the point of Leviticus is to show how corrupt Israelites can live near God's goodness without being destroyed. Now, in the book, there are three ways for how this is all going to work out, and these are going to seem strange to you, but just hang in there with us. The first one is rituals, the second is this idea of the priesthood, and the third is a bunch of purity laws. 
Now, the book is broken up into seven sections, and each solution is explored in two sections of the book. The rituals are here, the priests are here, and the purity laws go here. Now, the first solution, rituals, involves a lot of animal sacrifices. And so Leviticus begins with detailed instructions for how to make these sacrifices. Some are ways of saying thank you to God, and others are simply ways of saying I'm sorry. And here, at the end of the book, there are some more rituals. These are about observing sacred days and festivals. They're all celebrations that retell some part of the story of how God rescued Israel and set them apart from the nations. The second solution to the holiness problem has to do with priests. You see, being directly in God's presence is really dangerous. So he appoints priests as special representatives who can go into his presence on behalf of others. So in this section, we have a story about how the priests are ordained into the priesthood. And then this other section explains the set of higher standards that the priests have to live by because they work so closely to God's presence. The third solution in the book is all about purity laws. And this is by far the hardest thing to understand. For example, in this section, we're really concerned with knowing whether you're clean or unclean. Or another way of saying that is being pure and impure. And here's what we need to know to understand this. When you're in a pure state, you can be near God's presence. When you're in an impure state, you can't. And so it was really important for Israelites to know what state they're in at any given moment. So the first thing we have is a list of pure and impure animals. Yeah, this list of animals is divided up by where they live. So on the land, in the sea, in the air. And the text is just not clear about why certain animals are impure or why touching or eating them makes you impure. What is clear, however, is that avoiding these creatures will set Israel apart and it will remind them that God's own holiness should affect every part of their lives, including what they eat. After the food laws, we get a lot of random rules about things like skin disease, touching dead bodies, what to do with bodily fluids. But they're not random. All of these are things that the Israelites associated with life and death, which are sacred things because God is the author of life. Okay, but simply coming into contact with these things makes you impure? They do, but we have to keep in mind that it's not wrong or sinful to be ritually impure. You just wait a few days, take a bath, offer sacrifice, and you're pure again. What is inappropriate is entering into God's presence when you're in an impure state. Now, there's more purity laws over here in this section. Yeah, these focus on Israel's moral behavior. So these are laws about social justice, healthy relationships, having sexual integrity. Living by these laws will make Israel into a morally pure people who can live near God's presence. Those are the three solutions. Now, you've probably noticed that they surround the very center of this book. And it's here that we find a really important ritual called the Day of Atonement. Yeah, so Israel's a big tribe now, and odds are there's a lot of sin happening that goes unnoticed, that people are not dealing with. And so one time a year, the priests would take two goats, and one of those goats is killed, and its blood is carried right into God's presence where it symbolically covers or atones for Israel's sin. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Well, the meaning of the sacrifice, it's explained in the next chapter, where God says that the blood of a creature is its life. And so this goat's life is offered as a substitute. It's receiving God's punishment for Israel's sin so that the people don't have to. That leaves the second goat. Yeah, the priest puts his hands on it, and then he confesses all the sins of Israel. It's like he's placing the sins on the goat. And then that goat gets cast out forever into the wilderness. It's called the scapegoat. Yeah, I've heard that word before. Yeah, it's this very powerful image of how God is graciously removing Israel's sin. But let's be honest, sacrifices in general seem so barbaric. We have to remember that in the ancient world, sacrifices were the main way of buying favor from the gods. But the problem was that those same gods, they're unpredictable, they're fickle, you never know if they're going to ignore you or they're going to turn on you. And so it's in this cultural setting that we see Israel's God as totally different. He does get angry about human corruption, but it is never arbitrary. And he loves people. So he provides this clear way for Israel to know with confidence that they are forgiven and that despite their corruption, they are safe to live near his presence. And so that makes the book of Leviticus actually a revolutionary statement in its day. So that's Leviticus. 
But Israel's still at Mount Sinai in the middle of the wilderness. They need a place to live. Yes, the land God promised to Abraham. And so the journey to that land is what the next book of the Bible is all about. You'll have to watch that one on your own. Okay? You'll, just have to, you'll have to go watch Deuteronomy if you want to see that one. Was that helpful? Just to see uh, how the book is laid out, to understand some of those themes and, and the structure. Uh, I thought that was incredibly helpful for us to be able to understand what God is doing in the Old Testament. Like, what is what were all of these laws about, all these rituals, all of these purifications and sacrifices and uh, that God has prescribed for his people? What was it he was doing? What was it he wanted them to know? What is it we can learn from those? I thought this gave us really good handles to be able to to, to, to look at this together in a, in a helpful way tonight. So wanted to kind of set the stage there with that. You've got in your in your notes now just some of the places then in Leviticus and Numbers where the word atonement is used. I wanted you just to scan this real quick. We're not going to take time to read each of these verses, but look at the different ways, the different um, that the word atonement is used, the different things that Israel had to to atone for, had to make atonement. Look at this first one. This first one has to do with a home that has mold in it. It's a home that is unclean. There was, there was a process. There was a, a cleansing, a purification that had to take place uh, for this home. I thought it was important in the video where he said there was some being ritually unclean. And what was it he said about that? Is that sinful to be ritually unclean? Like to have mold in your house, does that mean you had sinned? No. No, it's not what that meant. But but there was a, a process for there to, for your home to be clean. And so it says here, um, he shall make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. If we had read, if we I just gave you a little bit of verse 53, but if you went back and read in verse 48, there is a sacrifice that had to be made in order for the home to be declared clean. A woman after childbirth, is it sinful? Is she, has she sinned giving birth? No. No, but there is, a, there is a ritual cleansing process that has to take place, and so there was a sacrifice that had to be made for her so that she could be ritually clean before the Lord. A leper who has been healed, same thing. Is that skin disease um, make him, is it sinful? No, but there's a process, just like we saw with the others here. A Nazarite who has broken his vow. That could be a Nazarite was to not ever touch the fruit of, of the vineyard. So that could have broken his vow. He could have touched something that was dead. Uh, that would have been breaking his vow could have cut his hair, um, so could be sinful, um, could be an accident. He could have come in contact with something dead, completely of no fault of his own, but yet there is a process here for him to be declared clean. These ne this next one here, the sacrifice uh, for an individual who has sinned, we see that atonement must be made. This is where we begin to think, when we think about atonement, some of your answers at the very beginning were, hey, this was a payment for sin. This was a way to be purified from, from your sin before the Lord. And so we see that is also an example in the Old Testament. The Levites, before they would go in the temple to serve, they would have to go through a process and offer sacrifice. A sacrifice would be offered for them in order for them to stand before the Lord and serve him on behalf of the people. And so all of these different um, prescriptions for, for atonement, right, they're detailed. This is what would be offered. This is how it would be offered. But they were all for what we just saw in the video. It was this way for God's people to be able to live near his presence. I like the way that was described there. But there was something that had to take place in order for, for that to be possible. And what was that? The complete sacrifice? Yeah, a sacrifice had to be made. Okay. What kind of sacrifice? In, uh, uh, 
a blood sacrifice. Yeah, a blood sacrifice, right? A, a death had to occur. Blood had to be shed uh, in order for atonement, for sin to be made, for there to be purification, cleansing, uh, made right. And so these are these are important things to, to understand. Uh, it helps you kind of make sense of just, like he said, the, the weirdness of, of some of these things. But it's not weird. There was a there was a message that God wanted His people to understand. And what is that message? What was it God was wanted His people to see? The price had to be paid for sin. Okay, a price had to be paid for sin. What else? Separate from the other nations. Okay. Yes, that they uh, that he called them to be set apart from other nations. They were to live differently. They were called to be a holy people, uh, set apart to him. Very good. Anything else? Okay. Re yes, Re reconciliation. Them, his people with himself. Yeah, to be reconciled to him. Show his holiness. Very good. Yeah to show his holiness. They could not just approach God any way they wanted to. Uh, God, God is holy. Um, I remember, you know, I spent a lot of years as a youth pastor. And so at the time, I think it, it hit me weird. Like when I saw this t-shirt, I was at a youth camp with my students and some kids were wearing a t-shirt in another group. And, and I saw it and I was like, I didn't, I didn't like it, but I didn't really like think through it. But I've thought through it since, and uh, it hits me that very thing. Just and I think I know why I didn't like it at the time. There was a T-shirt, and it just had a, a a drawing, a sketch of Jesus's face on the T-shirt. And over to the side, it said, "Jesus is my homeboy." Uh, Jesus is my homeboy. Um, was was what the T-shirt said, and I was like. No, like, you know, and, and just the more I, I thought about it, it's like, he's, he's not that. Like, he is Lord, right? He's not our homeboy. He's not our, our buddy uh, that, that we just pile around with. He's, he is God. Uh, he is holy. He is set apart. Um, to come into his presence is a, you should do so with reverence and awe and fear and trembling to stand before holy God. And and this idea of atonement has to be made, right? There has to be a, a certain way you approach God and you must do so clean. Helps to remind God's people over and over again throughout the year that they must be clean in order to approach God. Yeah, it's why, it's why the Bible is written the way that it is in progressive revelation, right? So the Bible itself says that the Old Testament law is a tutor so that you would understand the Lord, right? So God himself did not start with, here's my son, Jesus. What did he start with? Well, I mean, he started with this, right? He started with the temple. He started with the law and and understanding even if it's difficult even if we say yeah that's weird it is good for us it is right for us to understand because if you too quickly jump to Jesus without comprehending all that Jesus accomplished for you you say things like Jesus is my home boy okay but the reality is to, to sit and to think through like that there are natural things that occur in your everyday life in the Old Testament that would require atonement for you to just be able to go and worship the Lord. That's good. So four things. I think these are important, and these give us big buckets to think about this whole sacrificial system. What is going on? What is it it is supposed to, to remind uh, Israel of as they, as they kept these laws, as, as they did these things, the purpose of this system? One, to bring them to a place of repentance, 
to see where they were unclean, to see their sin and to repent of their sin. The sacrificial system kept repentance at the forefront of their mind, that they must turn away from sin. Think about even just the, the picture. Think about what's going on. We see, we see drawings and paintings of the temple. What, what, what strikes you in those paintings, typically, of the temple? What, what do you, when you see them, what, what are your thoughts about what you see? We go back. When you see the temple, you see the curtain. Okay, you see the curtain. What else? I mean, what are just what are just things you see? This isn't a trick question. Just what are things about that structure that strike you? Unapproachable. It's kind of a. It's awesome. Right? There's an awe about it. Yeah. What else? Grand. Grand. Yes. Magnificent. Magnificent. Yeah, it's inspiring. You look at it from here, and you're like, "Wow!" Like it's it's there's so much gold. There's there's jewels. There's there's you know, if you were in the actual structure, you would see the, you know, the, the type of wood that was used to build it, and things that were overlaid with gold, and then the curtain that would have hung uh, to separate the holy place from the holy of holies. And wow, this is made of just fine uh, fine linen, and and it's dyed, and it's it's majestic looking. It's regal. Uh, all of those things are very true, but what went on in there? There were different entrances. There were different entrances, yeah. There was different places you could go and not go. But what went on inside there? There was there was a progression because there was the, the altar, and then there was the, the big bowl where the priest would wash before they went in, and there was the first veil. And they went in there to do certain things, and then it was once a year they went to the altar of Yeah, if you could, if you couldn't hear, it's just talking yeah. about the. There, there was a progression of things that the priests would go through <clears throat> in order to perform those things. The reality is, is uh, uh, the women and children couldn't go into that into those sections. The Gentiles couldn't go into those sections. It was man's reconnecting with God on. On a personal basis, yeah, yeah, I mean, represented the, the Jewish nation as when the priest went in there, but he personally went in to the Holy of Holies. The priest did once a year, yes. And yes, the, the temple in Jerusalem, the tabernacle prior to that, was it was where God dwelled with his people. And so, yes, you would see this in the and the the awesomeness of the structure was you knew. God dwelt there with his people. Uh, there was incense that would burn, right? There were these, these clouds of smoke, right? It was meant to be a visual reminder of with, even with the different sections where you could go that you could not just walk right up and anyone could walk in and do whatever they wanted to do because God was there. He dwelt there. But inside that structure, we don't think about this like we should sometimes in and when we were in Israel uh, last year, and we were standing on the Temple Mount, um, there are there are places where the stone uh, on the ground has it's 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 dip. There's like channels, um, almost like gutters, that are kind of carved into the stone on the floor in certain places where the temple would have stood on top of of that mountain there in Jerusalem, what would those have been for? What were those troughs? For the blood. For blood. Yeah, think about it. I mean, it's a grand structure, but think about what went on in there. Think about the number of animals that were slaughtered day in and day out, the blood that was shed. If you were to read through Leviticus, we're going to look here in chapter 16 in a minute, like the priests were dipping their hands in basins of blood and they were sprinkling it on things. I mean, just the amount of, you know, for us, it's like, oh, that's that's disgusting, right? That all this blood. I mean, there are when you go, uh, when you go to Israel and you hear about it, you you find out like one of the main jobs that the priests who would the Levites who would work shifts on in the temple, one of the main jobs was to go get buckets of water and just daily 
washing the blood away from the sacrifices that were that were performed in there. And so when we think about the purpose of this system, right, this this it's 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 gruesome, right? To think about death and, and, and animals having their, their throats slit and blood being spilled and death after death after death occurring in this place. One of the purposes of that was to remind you of the costliness of sin so that you would be quick to repent of sin, to want to turn away from it because you saw over and over how costly sin was and what it took to live in fellowship with the holy God. In seeing those sacrifices, you also understood that a price was paid, that a ransom had to be paid on your behalf in order for you to be right before God. You understood this idea of purity, right? As the blood was shed and it was sprinkled in places, as you saw the priest had to wash and become ceremonially clean to go in and stand before the Lord on behalf of the people to serve before them. They had to be pure. And so the sacrificial system reminded you of the importance of purity. And all of it was for this last one. Why is repentance important? Why was this ransom necessary to pay? Why was it important uh, to be pure, to maintain this covenant relationship with a holy God? And if the priest did something they were not supposed to do. They had a rope tied around them and it was so holy that they had to pull them out. They could not dare go in yeah. to where. That's right, here in just a minute, we're gonna read uh, about the Day of Atonement and the instructions that God gives for the Day of Atonement. And we're gonna read about the priest, the high priest on that one day on Yom Kippur, when he would go behind that veil to take the blood, to sprinkle it and pour it on the mercy seat. All these things are going to come together. He would come to, to pour that blood on the mercy seat. Before he ever did that, there is a whole list of things that he had to do before he went in. But here's what they did. Before he went in, they would tie a rope around his ankle and they would also put a bell on it. So that if if the bell quit ringing and, and he stayed in there too long, they could pull him out because nobody else wanted to go in to see if he was okay because they didn't want to be struck dead as well going into the presence of a holy God. So they made a concession for how to get him out uh, if he went in in the wrong way. Like that is how reverent this is. This is how important this what they, what they did, this process was uh, for them and how powerful of a visual these symbols were and the, that they God had called them to do. They decide whose lamb they were going to be sacrificed. I'm sorry? They decided. How did they decide which lamb? Yeah, whose who's lamb was going to be. The sacrifice, I mean, it would be the lamb without blemish. I mean, so they would, the lambs would be inspected before they were uh, to be slaughtered. Um, yeah, they so, choose the best. Yeah, the best. they take the, exactly. Um, that's a whole different, that's a whole different lesson, Mike, for us to look at. There's a whole incredible picture of, of the day um, around the Passover when Jesus was um, being questioned by the religious leaders and examined before them was the very day that in the Passover preparations, the lambs were being inspected for which one would be sacrificed. Like they, those things line up in the Holy Week uh, when Christ is sacrificed. So all these things line up. They're incredible to look at. Um, but it was, yeah, they were picking the most uh, perfect lamb in order to slaughter on behalf of, of the people. So, so we see these things with the sacrificial system. Uh, and there's some other things that are important for us to see here, this pattern for how atonement was made. <clears throat> Think about the things that were necessary. It was necessary for there to be one who performed the sacrifice. Who did that? The priest. Yeah, so there had to be a priest to perform the sacrifice. There had to be a place where the sacrifice was offered, right? It was slain on the altar, 
On the Day of Atonement, where was the blood taken? Mercy. To the mercy seat. It was poured out and sprinkled on the mercy seat. So there's a place where it's offered. And then there is the sacrifice itself. Right? So these three things are really important. And they're going to be incredibly important next week when we look at this in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, every day of atonement, these things are there. All the sacrifices that are made throughout the year, even not on the Day of Atonement, these things are, are there. Uh, what does the mercy seat represent? What does it represent? What does the mercy seat represent? It represents God's throne on it, or his footstool on the earth. It, it is said that the, the reason it's called a seat is because uh, God's presence resides above the oh. ark. So that is that is God's throne. The the ark with the with the cherubim, that is a picture of God's throne. All right. So we're gonna try I'm gonna try on purpose to leave you hanging a little bit this week so that you have to come back next week to see how all of this comes together in Christ. Um, so this will be good. Here's a verse they talked about in the video, but I want you to see it before we look in depth here at Leviticus 16. Look at Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Gee, look at that before chat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there are very few uh, verses that I'll allow you to get a tattoo of, and this is one of those. You get a tattoo of this verse. <laughs> this, is, this is an important, important passage of Scripture. Why is it so important? Why is this so significant? It points to Christ. Absolutely. It was a sacrifice for us to be God. Blood was the only thing that was the perfect sacrifice for God. Okay, blood must be shed. Right? There was no other. And why was blood? I mean, what does this say? Why was blood being shed the appropriate? means for atonement because blood is life yeah the life of the person is in the blood if there is no blood in your body you are yeah you're dead uh, what what was the what was the curse of sin what did god tell adam and eve you know on the day you eat of the fruit of the tree you will watch surely die, die. Yeah, like the, the curse, the curse of sin. Romans 3, 23, the wages of sin is death. Right? I mean, so this, the, the price for sin is death. And so this picture here before the people day in and day out was life is in the blood. And so in order for sin to be paid for, blood must be shed. Death must occur for someone or something in order for someone else to be to have life. Yeah, because if you break the word of atonement down, it means that water. That water. At one with God, yeah. reconciled to God. I've heard that before. Yeah. And and there is it's kind of like saying justification uh, is like saying just as if I had never sinned. There's uh, there's an element of that. Uh, okay, uh, I can go there. Uh, it's not 100% accurate. You know, it's not the an exact definition of justification. It's getting close. Uh, uh, at one moment is is understanding atonement is how one is made right with God, how their debt is paid. Uh, but it's deeper, it's richer, it's it's fuller than that. That's a good starting point uh, for us. But but to go deeper like we're doing is really important to, to understanding what we're looking at here.
Um, let's look at Leviticus chapter 16. Um, you know, here's what I would like for you to do before we just look at some different parts of this, because uh, we're not going to go through the whole thing verse by verse, but what I would like you to do, I think you, in 10 minutes or less, probably about seven minutes, mm -hmm. I'll give you, you should be able to read uh, Leviticus chapter 16. You've got it for, the, for you there in your notes, if you want to read it out of your notes or if you want to read it out of your Bible, either way, but let's just take a minute and read that passage, and then we're going to come back and discuss it for for a good bit of time we have left together before we move on to one other one other passage, okay? So take a set of minutes to do that. All right, so let me call your attention back together. Let's uh, let's let's talk it out together, out loud, so that we can think through this movement. Um, you saw how central it was in the book of Leviticus. <clears throat> think of. Uh, uh, think of the importance of this festival in the life of uh, an Israelite every year and where this is going, right? So you see how central this is. So now let's think, it's, it's the Day of Atonement. Now, this was the very first Day of Atonement, and Aaron is going into the tabernacle, um, uh, after his sons have been struck dead. That's that's a whole other fun story uh, uh, for another day uh, in terms of like they were struck dead for entering into God's presence in an unworthy manner. God struck them dead. So, um, but now Aaron's going to do it and this is going to be the prescription here forward for what must take place. Um, so what's the first thing that has to happen on the Day of Atonement? Who, who do we start with? <coughs> All I can hear is the mumblings. The high priest. Yeah, so we're going to start with the high priest. Aaron. All right. Uh, how's the high priest dressed? Oh, no. Fancy. He's got he's got his own uh, prescriptive clothing, right? That's important. Every, everything that is done with this entire process is prescriptive, uh, all the way down to the clothes and everything you're supposed to wear. So Aaron has his high priest clothes on. Uh, he's done whatever ritual washings and things he needs to do in order to just put those clothes on. All right, and now he is set. Uh, it's the Day of Atonement. Everyone's gathered together. What's the first thing, or what's the next thing that now occurs? It's called for a bull. Aaron is going to offer the first sacrifice, and what is that sacrifice? It's a bull, yeah? A bull, and what is Aaron, what or who, who is Aaron offering the sacrifice for? Himself. Okay. So he offers the bull as a sacrifice, and then you collect the blood, right? And then what is, does he do with the blood? Sprinkles it. So he specifically goes into the Holy of Holies, all right? So this is the only time all year long that you're allowed to go in there, into this room. So the, the temple itself is called the Holy Place. Okay? The whole temple is called the Holy Place, but it's partitioned into two parts. Uh, there's one-third in the very back and then two-thirds. Two-thirds are what the priest goes in every time he's assigned and does the, the usual. There's uh, the lighting of the menorah. There's the incense, and there's the bread, the showbread. All, all three of those things have to be in the holy place at all times. But only once a year do you go behind the curtain, behind the veil, back to the Ark of the Covenant, to the holy place. So this is the one time, and the first time he goes back there, he goes with the blood of a bull, and he sprinkles it. 
Okay, and what you should notice, right, there's very specific instructions to sprinkle the blood of this bull. Um, yeah, and, and where it needs to go, right? And again, who is the sacrifice for? Just for him, just so he can go back there, right? Just that one. So talk about what the, think about what that communicates in this entire process. The one time anyone can go back there, this is it, okay? Now, so Aaron's done that, he's sprinkled seven times, he comes back out. What, what occurs next? Kills the goat, kills the goat. There are two goats. We don't kill the goat yet. We've got to figure out which goat to kill. How do we do that? Casting lots. There's two goats that have been chosen there. There's a casting of lots for which one will be killed. Okay? So now, we've determined which one will be killed. Aaron sacrifices the goat, collects the blood, now goes back into the Holy Holies, and what is he going to do in the Holy of Holies? Blood. Exact same process that he did before. For who or what is this sacrifice? No. For who or what is this sacrifice? It is not for the sins of the people. For who or what is this sacrifice? The Holy Blood. What does it say? For the Lord. Verse 16. What does it say? Take atonement from the holy place. For cleansing, making purifying the holy place. Okay? So think about that. Remember Aaron just went back there. And uh, he had to offer a sacrifice for himself just to go back there. And now the priest, it's the only other time he goes back there. And he purifies the place, cleanses the place. That's what that atonement is for. Okay? Now he comes back out. What do we do next? Next goat. There is a goat left. It's the sin. What does he do with that goat? Let's cleanse it out. Okay. Before he sends it out, he has to do something very important. Make the sins of the people he wants. That's right. So imagine this. You've been there that day. Everyone watches with anticipation, uh, particularly the the Israelite males who can be uh, closer and see. You've, you've watched Aaron go in the Holy of Holies twice, okay? Hoping, right, that he returns. You've just seen his, his two sons struck dead, okay? Because did not offer sacrifices appropriately. Now Aaron comes out. He's alive. The Lord has accepted those offerings. And now the high priest... He lifts up his hand, puts his other hand on top of the goat, and with a loud shout so that everyone can hear, pronounces the sin of all the people of the nation, the covenant people, upon the goat. Okay? You're seeing this. All right? That goat has now become, right, the sins of the people. What then happens to the goat? Sin out the goat free. Yeah, he's taken outside the camp. Uh, there, there are uh, historical reports that say that the, uh, the Israelites would, uh, would hiss and spit at the goat uh, because he's become sin and is taken out into the wilderness and released. Now what happens to a goat that's taken out into the wilderness and released? 
Yeah. Right. And so, never to return. That is the picture that is replayed every year. Every year. Daniel, how does this section close? Look down in verse 34. I mean, we, we see after, after everything we've just described, Aaron takes off his, the garments that he was wearing. He bathes his body again. Um, he puts his other garments back on. Um, and to the day comes to a close. But look at what it says in verse 34. This shall be a statute forever for you that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. Think about this, the communication of this message as this is instituted, but then the reminder of it is they would think about this year in and year out. We will have to do this forever. Why? Because there will always be sin in the camp, right? No matter how, no matter how much we try to live pure, we will sin. There will always be sin in the camp. Sin in the camp will keep us from being able to dwell in the presence of God. And so year after year, forever, we will have to go through this process every year in order to have another year of living in covenant relationship with Yahweh God. That's, that's the picture. And when I think about that picture, on one hand, it's, there's, there's hope and, there's, and it, it's, it's merciful, it's gracious that a holy God who did not have to institute this did so in order for his people to dwell in covenant with him, right? So there's mercy and grace that is very visible in this, but isn't there some, it's, 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 it's heavy as well, is it not? I mean, this day is, this day of atonement is the most sacred day and there's also a, there's a solemnness to this day every year because it is this reminder that this will always be something with us. It is this burden, it is this in front of our face year after year that we are sinful before a holy God. And we can do nothing to change that. That we must go through this process over and over and over again because we sin over and over and over again. Yeah, and, just, and think of the distance for, for every individual. Okay. If you're not a Levite, if you're not the high priest, if you're a female, if you're a Gentile, think of the distance of God over there, all that requires the layers upon layers of separation. So this picture that the Old Testament paints the theological term we use, if you look on page 25 of your notes, is this idea called penal substitutionary atonement. This is what is taking place in the Old Testament. There is a sacrifice that has to be made. It is, there is a substitute making this sacrifice. Why? Because there is guilt and but the penalty must be paid in full. And it's, but God allows, rather than you paying it, he allows one to pay it for you. This bull, this goat, to pay it for you so that your sin can be atoned for. Penal substitutionary atonement. This is that picture that runs through this system that the Israelites are are participating in year after year. So this is this is the picture. Next week we're going to really unpack that as we as it pertains to the gospel. But the Old Testament foreshadows. Well, and, and to to reference what you said earlier, think back to uh, 
um, Genesis 22 and Isaac and Abraham walking up the mountain. Remember the question that Daniel said uh, can actually frame the entirety of the Old Testament. And that is, where is the lamb? Okay. And in that moment, do you remember what Abraham replied to Isaac? God will provide. God will provide for himself. Okay. God will provide the sacrifice. And then, did God provide the sacrifice? Yes. Yeah, remember? God stops, uh, God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. God provided. And at the conclusion of that entire scene, uh, as is very common, um, Abraham named the altar and that and that mountain, right? He named that altar. What did he name that altar? He named it, God will provide. But this is one of those unique spots where in the Old Testament where it uses a compound name for God, okay? Uh, if, if, you know, we've done before studies on the names of God. And, and this name is Yahweh Yidin, okay? Or you may commonly hear Jehovah Jireh, okay? Yahweh Yidin. And that means Yahweh is the God. This is the sort of character. This is the kind of God that he is. He is a God who provides. Now, as Daniel just described, if you were part of the Day of Atonement, right? By the way, the Day of Atonement occurred on that same mountain, Okay, day in, or, or year in and year out on that one special day. And then so if you were a good uh, Hebrew and looking forward to this, you would think through that ceremony even as far back as you were from it. And you would be thinking, God has provided yeah. through, through the Day of Atonement, through the High Priest, through the blood of bulls and goats, God has provided so that I can be forgiven. And we're going to see next week. I mean, as Jason just said, God provided a substitute for Isaac on Mount Moriah. The temple sat on Mount Moriah. So we see God providing a substitute for an individual by providing the, the ram. We see year after year on the Day of Atonement on that very same mountain, God providing a substitute for a nation to atone for their sins for that year. What do you think next week when we look at this, who are we going to look at next week? Jesus. The cross was on Mount Moriah. So we are going to see in this very same place God providing a substitute to pay for the sin of all mankind to be made right with him. So this picture is a thread that runs through the whole Bible, but it's so significant in the Old Testament, and they would have known this. Right? That is the spot where Abraham, our forefather, would have declared God will provide, and year after year, God provided the prophets, Isaiah, you know this passage in Isaiah chapter 53. It points to the one who would come, right? Israel was looking just like Isaac. Where is the lamb? They're asking every year, where is the lamb that will atone for sin? Isaiah points to and says there will be one who comes who will bring salvation to God's people through substitutionary atonement and and just some of the phrases you've got the whole uh chapter of isaiah 53 in your notes but just even on the screen look at these phrases that point to this idea of a substitute atoning for your sin he is born our grief carry our sorrows on him was the chastisement that brought us peace his wounds brought us healing the lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. What do we see in Leviticus 16 that we should think about when we think about that phrase? The 
The scapegoat. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was stricken for the transgressions. God put him to grief. He was the one who bore our iniquities and bore the sins. So even in, in the, one of those chapters that we look at to say it is such a, a beautiful picture of what Christ, this prophecy of what Christ would do to bring salvation to us. The whole thing is this picture of atonement. Substitutionary atonement is what rings out, that shouts to us from from the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus. Yeah, 700 years before Christ. So this this passage of Isaiah 53, 700 years before Christ. What What you should know as you're reading your Old Testament Yes, we have the Day of Atonement, year after year after year. But the Old Testament itself begins to anticipate what? A greater fulfillment, a, a replacing, a, that, that this system that the Lord has provided is actually beginning to point to one, a servant, that is coming. And that's why we, when you read this language and you immediately go, oh my goodness, some, that language is talking about Day of Atonement type language. That's, that's making me think of, of the Day of Atonement, what occurs there. And yet it's on the servant of the Lord. So, so it begins to anticipate. The scripture itself begins to point you forward. Okay? This is progressive revelation. God started and began here, but again, he begins to unfold and begins to show you. No, no, no. This was the tutor that is actually leading and pointing you towards a, a better day, a greater day. There is coming a servant. There is coming a one who himself will take on the iniquity of us. Okay. So next week, that is... What we are going to do, we are going to look squarely at the person of Jesus to see how he is the fulfillment of everything that we spent this week kind of just combing through these details of the Old Testament. We're going to see how the New Testament presents Jesus, uh, and it's just going to be beautiful. I could not help. I put it in your notes for you. Uh, I think this is my favorite hymn old hymn. I, I say that about a lot of them, but I really think I mean it when I say this one. Um, Philip Bliss wrote this. He wrote the music for several hymns that you know, uh, but he also wrote a lot of powerful lyrics. He was a contemporary of D.L. Moody. Uh, he was going to be D.L. Moody's worship leader on his crusades through the U.S. and England, and he was on his way to meet up with Moody, and at 38 years old, he was killed in a train wreck. Uh, and so his life was cut short. But even before this, this was written, this hymn that you have here was written a year before he passed away. And it was sung probably for the last time in a prison in central Michigan before 800 inmates. And the story is that this, there was a sermon preached on atonement and he sung this song. And there were, there were many, many inmates who gave their life to Christ as a result of this. But I just want you to look at these lyrics as we, as we close here. Uh